What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode seven of the Unite Asia podcast. My name is Riz. All right, let's jump right into the news for this week. Let's see. We've got Thai metal band called The Darkest Romance, who just released an epic music video, have announced that that video and that song are part of a five-track EP, and they've released a trailer for that. You have to check it out. This band clearly has put no parameters around them, and they're just letting the music run wild. It's amazing. They're pretty much like arena-shattering type of music and a type of band, so go check that out. What else we got? We got Malaysian hardcore band Left to Fight have announced that they've been working on a new album. And they've got a little clip up on on their Instagram, so check that out. Nepali hardcore band Void Turn to Message have announced that they're going to release a debut EP. And I believe there's a little bit of a clip on their Instagram as well, so go check that out. Also on the news front, our very good friend Gaga of Modern Guns has started up his own record label called Native Vision Records, and he just put out the first track of the first band that he signed, Palm Dreams. Check it out. If you like early title fight and stuff, this is your jam. Defeat the Giant, Taiwanese hardcore band, had just released a brand new live video, and it debuts a brand new song. So you can kind of hear a little bit of their new direction. It sounds a little bit more old school hardcore sounding, but they're rule, man. That band is so good. So you got to go check that out. Brand new song. Um, it w- They were working together with a studio in Taiwan to put them inside a studio, and then they had some live cameras filming their performance, and they recorded it, and the audio is phenomenal. Go check that out. Beijing hardcore band Unregenerated Blood just played their very first show of 2020 now in September. Um, And they've got a little bit of a clip of that song. It's at one of my favorite venues in all of Beijing called School Bar. So go check that out. That was up also on United Asia. All right, United Asia's Picks of the Week. So here are the two that really stood out for me. And as I've mentioned before, I put up so many posts every day, it's really hard to remember all of this. So what I do when I come up with this list is really just think about one of the most obvious ones that stood out, that really grabbed my attention. There really are two. The first is a band that I mentioned earlier called The Darkest Romance, a Thai metal band who released a crazy music video earlier this week. And it's such an intense video. And what really stood out, besides the music being just phenomenal, there's an actress in this video that really is driving the entire music video. You have to check it out. It's her story, her journey about her relationship just fizzling out or breaking apart, falling apart. And she just gets so emotional and so candid in this music video. It's intense. It really, really is intense just watching her. And then the music just becomes a soundtrack to this story that's being narrating in the, vi- in the video. Go check that out. It's called The Darkest Romance. The other one that really stood out is this Korean band called Billy Carter I'd never heard before. And then after I put the post up, after I shared an IG, a bunch of people from Korea were like, man, this band has been incredible for years. I have never heard of them. So they just released their second album and it's just, it's it's insane. It's such an insane collection of music because the sheer quality and the talent that this band exudes in their music is just phenomenal. And hopefully if we ever get to visit Korea, if I get to visit or whatever, hopefully the band is playing. I can't wait to check them out. So Billy Carter released their new album. Go check that out. It's insane. Their lyrical content, man. They talk about LGBTQ rights. And of course, as soon as I saw those lyrics, I was like, yep, I'm sold. This is a band that I will back forever. So check them out. Billy Carter from Korea. However hard I try to have myself from you. And then now we get to come to the reader's picks of the week. Now, remember, if there was a standout for you and then I don't mention it here, it's because you never mentioned anything. All right. So I check on Facebook and I check on Instagram. I put a post up every week that says, all right, it's that time of the week. Reader's pick of the week. And then you just have to comment below what was the post that you enjoyed the most. So we've got quite a few here, right? Number one, the biggest one that got the biggest reaction on IG, especially was Zero Four Hero. Uh, they released a brand new album that just got blown up on my IG. So go check that out. Do you ever feel invisible when nobody wants to talk to you? Invisible. You're not invisible. Do you ever feel invisible? 
Then we also got long-running grindcore band from Indonesia called Proletar. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. But they just released a trailer for their upcoming documentary, and people were stoked on that. Check that out. Creep Out, heavy Japanese hardcore band from Japan. They just released a music video off their brand new album, so go check that out. People were stoked on that. Of course, SMZB, man, one of the bravest Chinese punk, metal, hardcore, whatever. One of the bravest bands out of China who constantly release music and music videos that are challenging whatever's going on in that part of the world. And they just released a couple of videos that are pretty powerful. So please go support them, SMZB. Their new album comes out in about November-ish. One that um, also got mentioned was Lout Spell, this brand new DB Youth Crew Hardcore mix from Indonesia. And man, that is amazing. I don't even know why I didn't pick that in United Asia's Pick of the Week. I should have. But that was a Reader's Pick of the Week. That really is a great release. You should go definitely check that out. <laughs> All right, let's move into the interview portion. Our interview today, our guest is amazing. His name is Hassan. He was a vocalist of a grindcore band from Pakistan called Multinational Corporations. Previous to that, he was in a band called Foreskin. He is someone that I've known for several, several years, and I've known him through the internet. We've never actually met face-to-face, -face, but he's always been someone that's super vocal about his feelings and his thoughts and opinions, very opinionated person, which I really respect. Even if maybe we don't agree, I do respect that he is willing to put his thoughts out there. Um, I invited Hassan because he is a Pakistani that grew up in Pakistan. I'm a Pakistani that grew up in Hong Kong. Our life experience are very different. So I've got, like many of you, I have a perception of what life might be like in Pakistan and how difficult it might be, how f infrequent shows are probably. So I wanted to interview him just to kind of get a background of what really is life like in Pakistan. And he just really blew my mind. I was like, oh, I didn't even know that in Lahore, where he's from, shows happen so often. So it was really was a cool conversation. I hope you enjoyed. It's about an hour long. Um, he has so much to say, like I mentioned, that I'm going to probably bring him back for a part two later on, uh, maybe later on this year or next year, so we can continue the conversations because he does have a lot of life experiences to share. So enjoy that conversation. I just want to mention that during this week that I was doing this interview, it was really cool that two other things about Pakistan showed up. One is this Pakistani British actor, Riz Ahmed, who has released a trailer for a brand new vi a movie that he's putting on about drummers losing their hearing. And it, that trailer is so insane and he's such a great actor that I was just completely moved by that trailer and I thought it was a true story maybe it is I don't know um, and while I was watching it I thought I was, it was like an actual documentary that's how good his acting is I just want to drop that in there because it just so happens that Pakistani podcast dude interviews a Pakistani guy in Pakistan a Pakistani actor in England released a, a trailer for a movie also Vice Asia released this great mini documentary of Orat March which is a women's movement in Pakistan that's been going on for a couple of years now and I've been following them ev everything they release on Instagram or Facebook whatever it is I've been following I take check every single post I stop what I'm doing because I want to see what the women's movement is all about in Pakistan and just support them with all I can so check out that Vice Asia video that was released it is quite emotional it's quite intense um, you will have a lot of thoughts you'll find a lot of despair but at the end of it they do show some hope that there is some hope for the women's movement in Pakistan for them to to get their rights back please enjoy this please enjoy this episode please go check out all those things that I just mentioned it'll all be in the description below peace What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode seven of the United Asia podcast. Today is a big day because my guest today I've known for years, but I've only known him through the internet. I have never met him face to face. We've never had a conversation on the phone. It's all been through the internet. This is my first time I actually get to sit down with him face to face, even though he's in Germany and I'm in Hong Kong. I'm introducing you to the vocalist of one of my favorite grindcore bands from Pakistan called Multinational Corporations. 
He also does time in hip hop as well. This guy is all over the map. And my favorite thing about him is that he's so knowledgeable about every genre of music. And here's a little secret. Before I started Unite Asia, he was the first person that I went to. I was like, hey, I'm going to start this website. What do you think? He's like, do it. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, today, my friend Hassan from, uh, from Germany, not Pakistan. How you doing, bro? I'm, I'm great, man. I'm, as we say in Urdu, Zabardast. <laughs> I hope you're great, too. Yeah, I'm doing all right in Hong Kong, man. Hong Kong has been a little crazy, bro. But I hear you're, uh, you're chilling in Germany now, huh? How long have you been in Germany? Yeah, dude, it's uh, almost been like one year. I came here for my studies and to do some other stuff while I'm here because, you know, the scene here is fucking amazing, better than Pakistan at least. So, yeah. And how did you get in Germany? How did you end up there? Yeah, like I was just looking forward to leaving Pakistan for like a long time. And I really didn't know how to go about it because, you know, there's a huge Pakistani diaspora. People are always going out all the time to settle in another country. But I I got in through the help of a friend. He used to study with me in my university. We were in the same degree. We studied film studies together. And he came to Germany at this university. And he told me, Hassan, this is the process. Here are the documents that you need, blah, blah, blah. And if it weren't for him, I wouldn't be here today. It's shout out to Sayyid Saddam, one of my best friends, for doing that for me. Hell yeah, man. Good for him. Did you, so you're there as a student. You, you didn't immigrate there. No, I'm like here for the next three years. And hopefully let's see if I'm able to find a job here after I finish my degree. If not, then I'll hop around the world, see what I can do. Hell yeah, man. I mean, now that, now that you're out of Pakistan, the, the world is open for you, bro. That's great. Yeah, bro. So Hassan, what we'll do is because uh, we really take this opportunity for our guests to talk about their path, their journey into heavy music. And honestly, you're a Pakistani that grew up in Pakistan. I'm a Pakistani that grew up in Hong Kong. Our journey to heavy music could be quite similar or it could be quite different. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to step back. And for you, a Lahori from Pakistan, tell us your journey of how you found heavy music and what were some of the first bands? Yeah, I mean, like, it wasn't, like, just one specific route into it, you know. It's always, like, a bunch of things. Uh, the first thing about Lahore, we had, like, a big music scene. It was, like, a lot of rock and roll in the scene and some metal bands as well. And I was always kind of attracted to the metal bands because of their whole aesthetic, the guys with long hair and denim jackets. And, you know, they were smoking some substances that I was fascinated by. <laughs> <laughs> and apart from that, it was also like the school I went to, um, almost every kid there who was between the ages of 12 to 15 listened to like old school 80s and 70s rock and metal music. Like if you didn't listen to Black Sabbath, if you didn't listen to Megadeth, if you didn't sing along to, you know, Call From Hell, you were considered like, you know, you're, you're just a piece of shit. You don't know what school, you know? So in, in my school, it was like a parallel universe because the world outside didn't really know much about rock and metal music, but that's what we were li listening to. You know, like my, I had friends covering Four Horsemen when they were just 13 years old, man, just going fast as hell. So it was all these influences. But the main thing for me that what really just drove me into the whole thing was the fact that there were music shops selling tapes and CDs like, it was the year 2006 and I found like a, a shop in Lahore called Offbeat and they've been around since the 80s or some shit, right? In 2006, they had posters of Megadeth, Motorhead and Saxon, an old new wave of British heavy metal band that not even like people really care about anymore. So yeah, like just being around that environment of music where metal was appreciated, people were enthusiastic, they wanted to learn about the music. That's what got me into it because it was the culture around it as much as the music, you know? That is amazing, bro. You just blew my mind. I had no idea because you're talking about 2006. So like when I used to visit Pakistan every summer <laughs> in the late eighties through the nineties, uh, no one had any idea about this type of stuff. Like, I mean, cause I used to go to Karachi 
And uh, when you're talking about your shop, the shop at Lahore, is it like um, original cassettes and CDs? Like original, not not dubbed, is it? No, they don't sell originals, right? So they, I, I don't know how they made their cassettes, but they had their own covers and the covers would just have the track list. So you would never have a visual idea of the band, you know, like I, in behind you, you have all these album arts and stuff and you can get attracted by an album art, pick it out. But for me, it was just like the textual side. Okay, this band is called Iron Maiden. This album is called Dance of Death or whatever. You know, I gotta have this. <laughs> you know, oh, that's interesting. So it was it was dubbed cassettes that you were purchasing then. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Dubs or like copied or reprinted in some you know typical Asian way. That is so funny that that is still existed in 2006. I thought for sure, because the last time I've been in, in Karachi was like 93 or 94, something like that. And we used to go to like a Tariq Street and on Tariq Street, there was like, there was like two or three shops on Tariq Street. And you walk in, it was all just dubbed, like just copies of copies of copies. But they, it was a business. It was a full-fledged business. It was crazy. That your upbringing and your environment that you found yourself in, like you were saying, is, is very it's completely the opposite of what people's imagination will be. You know, people will think like Pakistan, you know, a very Muslim country, very Islamic in so many regards, but you're saying in your school, metal was actually very cool. And if you weren't listening to metal, you were a piece of crap. Like even in schools outside of Pakistan, like I grew up in Hong Kong and our school here, metal was never cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, when I switched my school later, because I was kicked out for some stuff that I don't want to mention here, but when I got to the new school, it was like everyone just listened to 50 Cent and shit. I was like, what, where am I? You know, because my school was just different in that regard. And I guess that's very important for like my exposure to this kind of music. And apparently it was back, it was like this for a long time. Like my dad was there in the 70s and 80s, and he grew up listening to ACDC, Black Sabbath, Led Zeppelin, all those bands. So it was kind of uh, in the heritage of that school. That particular school. Now, that particular school, would it be considered like a local Pakistani school or were you at an international school? What kind of school was it? It was an old British colonial boarding house kind of system that was converted and to have like normal city people and stuff in there too. So it was a weird dynamic because we had like feudals from South Punjab, from Balochistan and Sindh and these kinds of places, really rich people with, you know, like coming from a gun culture and stuff. And we were just city kids, you know, we were just like more into like subcultures and stuff. So that, that, that was kind of like this divide that existed at the school. But even the kids who were from those kinds of families and those kinds of upbringing, they became really fucking cool musicians. I know a lot of people in the current music scene who come from some feudal background, but through that school and the music they got from that 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 school, they, you know, the, even their horizons were broadened. So yeah, yeah. So it's like the cheesy thing, right? The music is the the uniting force behind everything, huh? Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. And sometimes, like if I saw the movie uh, like School of Rock, sometimes it would remind me of my school because we had some teachers who would talk about music with us, you know. <laughs> Oh my God. I wonder how many people listening to this right now are having their mind blown. They're like, there's actually a school in Pakistan in 2006 where it was rock focused. Like even the teachers were talking about rock and roll. That's incredible, man. Yeah, dude, we had a, I just remembered we had like a, a, a gig night every year, like where all the cover bands of the school, they came to perform for the school themselves, right? And it was always like Megadeth's A Tout Le Monde being covered or For Whom the Bell Tolls by Metallica being covered. So when you see 300 kids in their school uniform at banging, you know. <laughs> and this is on school property that the show was happening. Exactly. And we even, uh, they even sung uh, Pink Floyd's uh, Another Break in the Wall, the We Don't Need No Education part. <laughs> and the teachers were all like, <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, what an open-minded school, right? Like they're they're very progressive in the way that this, they were running the school, realizing that all these kids, all these teenagers just need music or some sort of art to vent. And they're allowing you guys to do that in a safe space. Yeah, yeah, of course. And I think they saw the value in it too, because we were also a very violent school. The thing we were most famous for in Lahore and in Pakistan was that the kids there loved to fight. Like some one days I would 
go ho uh, go back home and on the way someone would see my teared up buttons and he'd be like you're from that school aren't you like yeah <laughs> so <laughs> they knew that through music and through this kind of stuff they could you know like groom us better as individuals maybe I mean, that's that's real education. You know what I mean? That's real education, real educators who are like taking the time to be like, okay, our our school and our kids keep going down this path. What can we do to kind of help them? Not like turn you guys into like, you know, law abiding citizens or whatever, but just be like, okay, within your world of angst and anger, which is an okay emotion to have, you've got to accept that reality. How do we help you guys foster this feeling? That's that That is incredible, man. So you're saying, Hassan, that even at that time, because you're saying about 2006, in Lahore, outside of your school, there was already a built community and scene for heavy music. Is that right? Yeah, man. Uh, there were like a lot of bands that have just like, people have forgotten their names, right? Because the scene never continues. It just, one group of people started, they wither out in another group. So there's no, not much continuity, like, like a proper scene must have. But some of those bands, I can mention them. There was a band called Corpse Fire. They played... Brutal death metal. And they were very influential on me. Like they showed me that, yeah, you can do growling, ab abrasive, like extreme fast paced music in Pakistan, right? And the guy Sakib Malik, he went on to do a lot of other experimentations in music as well. Like he did noise and drone and, and then electronic. And even that was an influence on me, like when I went into hip hop and other stuff. Yeah, so that batch of bands from 2000 and the early to mid 2000s of the Musharraf era of Pakistan are like very important to me. And we had like a lot of rock bands too, like Nuri, EP and Jal, like, but you know, like wherever there's a mainstream rock scene, there's always going to be like an uh, underground metal, death metal, et cetera scene, you know? So that was like a decent time musically for us. When you think of, think back to like your days in school and, you know, everyone around you is listening to metal. When you're walking around, you're listening to metal. Do you remember what your first show was? Because I, I'm sure everyone listening probably knows that not a lot of foreign bands tour Pakistan. <laughs> you know, they don't go through Pakistan. So for your experience, they're all local bands. Do you remember? Yeah, like uh, the thing was that the metal bands didn't really have their own shows in Lahore. They would show up as part of another, a bigger like festival. Like we had multiple rock fests a year that would happen and corporates were sponsoring these events. So we would have like gen generic rock gigs with two or three metal bands. I was too young. I was never given permission to go. But the first time I saw was a band called Ruin. <laughs> They were a cover band at the time. They just covered Raining Blood and some Lamb of God songs. And, but that was like a really intense experience for me because I was one of two people headbanging at the front. And this was like 2009 or 8. And at the time, the previous scene had completely like withered away, vanished. And I only heard the stories about the previous scene of Corpse Fire, of Seth and how people would show up on their motorbikes to watch them play and stuff, you know. But here I am headbanging with just one guy. <laughs> 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 what the fuck happened? So that was my first show and that, that first also inspired me to like, okay, like we needed to have just metal gigs for just metal fans, you know. And that was my second show, <laughs> the one that I put on myself. What? Okay, 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 okay. Hold on. We got to slow this down a little bit. Okay, okay. So you're saying you got into this stuff about 2006. And even at that time, you're saying there was already kind of a scene, but you're saying that the scene kind of is always transitioning. So people come and go, the scene blossoms, and then it just dies out. So your first real experience of watching a show was 2009 at, and you were saying a festival. So are you saying like a legit, like, not like <laughs> whacking, like a German festival? Like, what do you, what do you describe a, a, a festival in Pakistan? Yeah. So a rock festival, basically any kind of generic uh, rock gig in an auditorium or outdoor space was called a rock fest. And since in Pakistan, we don't have many clubs and bars and smaller venues to play in, it was always at bigger venues and it was always kind of a rock fest of some sort, you know. 
and you had different uh, multiple rock fests in the same city. There was like two or three in Lahore. There was one major in one in Karachi, and yeah, like that was the environment. It was all, all a lot of families coming in, right? A lot of guys, just guys, um, and just families. You know, it was that kind of uh, environment. And there was food being sold outside, I guess. But yeah, nothing really festive. It, it's not Woodstock, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but even then, though, like I mean, um, having a festival in Pakistan is is even whatever whatever it is. If it, if the festival or if it's a show, to me, that's that's super cool that that stuff was going on. But you're, I think you told me always that it was like a regular thing. Yeah, no, like um, in the early to mid two thousands. I was always every fucking weekend, every other month, I was being invited to some show or the other, oh. some festival or the other. And I could never go because my mom, she's like a single mom and incredibly anxious and she's never let a 13 year old kid go outside, you know, in Pakistan. So I missed out on all, on, on all that, but it was apparently very great. And a lot of my friends went to those shows and they always said they had an amazing time and such and such. And Apparently, there was a scene in the 90s too, and there was a scene in the 70s and 80s too. And up till that point, you could say they were all kind of connected. There was a continuity going on. People knew about who came before them and such and such. But when the whole uh, thing, I think it's because when the bomb blasts and everything increased, right? The war on terror, everything was came to Pakistan. And around the mid 2000s, everything culturally started going dipping, right? So shows became very less. And eventually when I finally got permission to go to shows, it was at that downward slope. So that was, I felt a huge contrast between what I was experiencing and what I, all the great stories that I had heard, you know. Interesting. So when you started going to shows, was it, it was already dipping. So it was no longer every weekend. Is that right? Yeah, it was very rare. Like you would have to wait for it, wait for a show. And suddenly shows became like twice a year. Wow. A year. Wow. That's my memory of it and my experience of it, you know, like and we could Google the facts or whatever, but this is what I remember. Wow. Go, so going from weekends of having shows consistent to two or three times a year. And do you think it's all because of the, the war and terror stuff or did Pakistan start to start to get into a little bit more of the militant style or? Yeah, like at the time as a kid, I couldn't like obviously understand, but there was this feeling that it's not safe anymore. Like uh, schools started having barbed wire around them. Shit. Events became less event areas uh, like Alhamra became more, had more security there because all of these institutions were being targeted by the extremists, you know. And I always felt even when I became like matured in my political thinking and everything, that this, the first casualty of the war on terror in Pakistan was not the, even before the physical death toll, it was the mental and cultural death toll, right? And it's created a mental health problem in Pakistan is this lack of access to it, to entertainment. Yeah, I mean, that's, I, I, I appreciate your candidness and your, you know, honest reflection of your life and what you experienced because a, a lot of us around the world, don't understand that, right? We do have access to music. We do have access to original pressings of CDs and LPs. And uh, and we do have access to, to shows. And we don't have to worry about our safety at these shows in that regard. I mean, if you're in the pit and you get punched in the face, that's a different thing. <laughs> and the worst thing was that uh, what I learned then after putting on my own shows was that the local authorities are fucking corrupt. They don't want art to flourish. They don't want events to flourish. They just want to make a quick buck. So, Hassan, when you started putting on shows, because you were saying earlier that you guys were, you know, mainly performing at your own school. So when you started putting on shows, was it easy to find venues? Was it, it like you were saying, it wasn't like a club. So was it like an empty hall you'd find? What did you find? By the time I wanted to put on my own show, I had gotten into hardcore punk, right? And hardcore has a completely different mentality, uh, right? It's all about DIY, right? Like, if you're not finding a space, fucking find one and make it happen. If you can't find sound, just fucking get a little money together, get something from somewhere, even if it's the cheapest quality, right? Just make something happen. And 
that was my mentality at the time. I've started my first band, Foreskin. We hadn't played a show yet. I wanted to play a show, and I also wanted to put on like a pure fucking like heavy music show. And there were only metal bands in Pakistan, and we were like a hardcore thrash crossover. So we thought, like, let's let's do it. If these guys don't know what DIY is, they got these guys want to wait around for sponsors to get into fucking Ali Institute or Alhamra or some other big hall. They don't know any other way. Let's introduce that other way, right? And we got a friend. He was our drummer. We got his backyard. We got some wedding tents, you know, the typical Punjabi wedding tent, the red floral designs. We covered the backyard a bit. We got the same wedding people to give us the wedding sound, you know, the shitty speakers. <laughs> and we got people to pitch in. So the the price was for all that, ten thousand rupees. We got 10 guys in our crew to give 1,000 rupees. And they all give a little more than that too, you know, just out of solidarity. Like, yeah, man, let's make this happen. And in 10,000 rupees, we put on like a fucking amazing show, man. Like there are still pictures of it online. I can show you. And it's all these little sweaty Pakistani teenagers, all like short height hair, no facial hair, no body hair, just <laughs> running around <laughs> crazy as hell, man. <laughs> Oh, dude, this is, that's the best story ever. How old were you at the time? I, I just turned 18. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. But we had, there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, the first thing that I want to unpack is that you said by this time, you'd already got into hardcore punk. And like you're saying so eloquently, hardcore punk is a whole different mindset from metal. It's a completely different universe. And so, so let's backpedal a little bit. As you were already getting into metal and hard rock and you're saying you had Black Sabbath and, and Iron Maiden, how did you then find your way to hardcore punk in Lahore? Dude, like no one in Lahore knew about like punk rock, let alone hardcore, right? Punk to Lahore was some 41 and Green Day, right? And I guess they are punk, you know, like I'm not going to be the elitist, but I was looking for something authentic, you know? I, I'm not ashamed to say that I look for authenticity in music. And if that makes me an elitist, like, fuck that, <laughs> you know? I like Green Day, I listened to the first album, but it's it's not punk, 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 you know? So I had the internet and I got into all these forums and stuff. And every, every thrash metal band is always talking about, yeah, Discharge, The Exploited, Black Flag, Dead Kennedys, blah, 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 minor threat. And I'm like, yeah, okay, this, this sounds fascinating. But I didn't really take the effort to download and listen until I saw this documentary called American Hardcore. And I guess it's not a well-received documentary by a lot of hardcore punk fans. But to me, it was like the perfect thing, right? Like I'm seeing on the screen, this guy saying that like, yeah, fuck all the right-wing bullshit. This is hardcore, this is something else. This is fast music to the point strong strong social political messages blah 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 so i i just got like sucked into that man like you know even my favorite metal band was megadeth because they had their political thing going so, like this is so much so much more in line with so that's a good story too so that's what you're I, I mean i think what it sounds like for you and a lot of people that do find their way to hardcore punk is that they are yearning for something, something different, something deeper, something more meaningful. And I agree with you. Like I grew up on metal and there are, there were some metal bands that had stuff to say for sure. I agree 100%. Like when Megadeth came out with Rust in Peace, you know, stuff like that, like those records, you're like, wow, this is suit. Like first song is like brother will kill brother, like on Holy Wars. And you're just like, yeah, I, I, but I agree with you that even with that, that's not like the, all of metal sings about that. There's actually quite a lot of metal bands and metal people who listen to metal who are just like, no, 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 I just want to rock. And in my head, I'm like, I, I know, I want to rock too, but I want to rock to something that means something. Like if I'm, if I'm going to spend time, memorize your lyrics and scream your lyrics, I want it to be meaningful. So that's really cool that you, at your age, you're already like, no, I'm looking for something deeper in this Green Day band, this Offspring band, this Blink-182 band. Yeah, sounds great. Sounds really good. But it's not what I want. It's not what, what means to me. Wow. And so th that DVD, uh, you watch it. Was it YouTube or what were you watching it on? Dude, uh, Torrance Zindabad. 
<laughs> <laughs> so you're downloading that shit. Yeah, illegal man. We couldn't get anything original in Pakistan. Yeah, yeah. Everything was illegal. So I, I got into my favorite subculture because of illegal memes. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you're watching that sh- that video, had you already been exposed to at least some of the names of the bands? Like you said, you know, you heard the main Black Flag, Dead Kennedys and stuff like that in the forums. Had you already checked it out? And what was your first impression when you had checked it out earlier? I think I I just heard Discharge, right? Hear nothing, see nothing, that album. And I I really didn't understand what was going on, I'll be honest, right? They're my favorite band now. But the first time I heard them, I I guess the production was even more murkier than metal stuff. And I didn't know how to react, you know? It was the same thing when I first heard Slayer, man. I was afraid when I first heard Slayer. I was like, this is, this is too fast, <laughs> you know? <laughs> But then I grew to love that. So it was the same thing with Discharge. But that's that's why I'm saying the documentary was very important for me because it, it added context to that whole audio quality and the sonic force and the yelling and all that, you know, like that made me understand it better. And now I'm at the point where you could put on something fast and it could have like just be an instrumental of a DB song. I'd be like, yeah, fuck yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I appreciate the sonic quality for what it is now right. as well. But yeah. But that's what I wanted to touch on is just because it's, I still have this situation now in 2020 where people, uh, you know, near where I live in the city where I live, when they hear bands like Chromags or uh, Discharge, like you're saying, any of those early 80s bands, like they cannot get past the production. They're like, but, but, it, why does it sound so bad? Why does it have to sound like this? And then if I have to sit there and kind of explain the hardcore punk rock ethos, I'm like, well, that's because these bands didn't have managers. They just went and did it. They went to any studio through whatever money they had down and were just like, just record this. And we'll record an entire album in like six hours. And did you have that same problem? Did you notice other people in Pakistan having the same issue with the, that like they couldn't get over the sonic sounds? Yeah, man, I think that's the main reason why punk based on genres never got so big in Pakistan because people want a little shinier production, you know, and metal has more of that. And in, in I remember when Foreskin used to play more shorter songs, more raw production, and everyone used to hate us. <laughs> and when Shalaz joined and he was a good producer and a good guitar player, and he had uh, like more musical like human, right? And people started like, Lighting us more because of that, <laughs> and <laughs> like I understand that as well. Like I, I also think that the later foreskin stuff was way, way, way better than the old stuff. But people weren't hating the old stuff because of because it was musically not good. They were just looking at at the production level, you know, which was really stupid for me. I yeah, I mean, and- like the raw stuff, you know, like Morbid Angel's first album is my favorite Morbid Angel album. <laughs> Right, and it's just it's just so interesting that that no matter where in the world, wherever there isn't really a much of a hardcore punk rock scene or community or understanding, that's the world that we're dealing with. We're always constantly battling against, oh yeah, I know it sounds raw, but when you see this stuff live, it's way more explosive than metal. And I don't know how to explain that without showing them. And that's why like when I first moved back to Hong Kong in 99, I knew that I couldn't just do a zine because that's what I was doing, was just doing a bilingual zine. Exactly what you just said. I was like, oh, let me sh- explain the ethos behind punk rock, the mentality behind hardcore and see if that will inspire you to start getting into bands. And then while I was doing the zine, I'm like, no, you still have to see it. You have to see it with your eyes and you can feel it. That even though it's just like a bunch of chords, it sounds like a bunch of chords, super fast beat. It's way more explosive than metal is. Yeah. So in Pakistan, I felt class was a big barrier because when I tried to introduce this kind of stuff to metalheads, they were always this. Usually the metal scene, even in my school and all these other places, were usually upper middle class people, right? Or middle class people who come from like upper caste backgrounds. And that that's that affects a lot of the kind of the way they see music and how music should be i guess right because how i felt when i listened to say agnostic front and chromex 
was that these people have gone through some struggles in their life. They they face some bullshit, right? They are not privileged people, and all that struggle, all that emotion, all that strife is coming out in their music. And they sing a big, big fuck you to all that, all those problems at the same time. And that really never resonated with a lot of, you know, the kind of people listening to Dream Theater or Opeth and you know that that kind of stuff. You know, they they want to think about more abstract notions and stuff. And that's perfect. I I love to as well. But if it's not having some real essence of life, you know, then what? Why? What's the point? You know. So did you face any kind of that barrier when trying to introduce this in Hong Kong? These ethos. Yeah, that's a great question, man. I mean, I, in Hong Kong, actually, the the biggest problem has always been language. It's always been language where hardcore and punk rock, like you have to read, right? You have to read zines and you have to read tons of magazines and stuff like that. And, and, and that's where you got the understanding from, not from listening to the music. I'll be honest with you. When I first heard punk rock and hardcore in Hong Kong, I hated it. I couldn't stand it. I thought it was just such a, it was just so messy. And it wasn't until I actually opened up a CD booklet when I read the lyrics, I was like, Oh, dude, what? I this is like my life as a Pakistani growing up in Hong Kong and dealing with racism and stuff like that. But so when I came back in '99, like uh, my issue was I'm like, okay, if I want to present this to people in Hong Kong, I, I've got to stop presenting it in a language that feels foreign to people. Like this has to be real. And so I, what I would do, I'd write it in English and I would get someone to translate all the articles into Chinese. And actually, it it got it was received much better than I thought it would be. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. So you had to uh, cross the language barrier to get more people involved, man. Right. Absolutely. I mean, in Hong Kong, it's it's always been that way. Where if you want to get into impacting and having some cultural change, unfortunately, it has to be in Cantonese. You have to pick up the language. I mean, that's how I picked up the language Cantonese when I was, when after I came back to Hong Kong a year later, I was like, this English is not working. <laughs> I was like on stage explaining the song then I'm like, this is not working. I got to pick up Cantonese. And that's, that's how I forced myself to learn it. So let's go back to your, so you're, you're saying with Foreskin and then you had your band members too. And you're saying you were more of a thrash. I'm assuming more like a crossover type of band, right? Yeah. The first, the first couple of demos were just crossover and like really bad crossover with like programmed drums and our live drummer who couldn't couldn't really play well he was learning at the time and he's a good drummer now <laughs> yeah yeah it was it was really but my, my mentality was like you know like we're all learning my guitarist is learning i'm learning how to do vocals and we're learning how to make songs and this is how the fucking first minor thread stuff came out as well you know they were just picking up this shit and figuring out on the way so I didn't care. I just recorded it and everything. Yeah, I mean, and that's that's the way to do it. I mean, a lot of bands, I, I think probably your experience too with the metalheads and the metalheads in Hong Kong as well, like they don't release music until it's perfect. Everything is perfect, right? The production is shiny, overproduced. Everything has to be perfect. Like that mentality of demos is gone. It's completely gone here. Yeah. <laughs> Because, I mean, everyone can just do stuff on computers now, right? So everyone can just plug in. And so they're like, why do I need to record a demo? I don't need to record a demo. I can just record a really good recording now on my computer. Yeah, of course. Yeah, definitely. So when you're doing Foreskin and you're putting on shows and you're saying that you had started when it was dipping anyway, did you see a resurgence? Was your um, your approach to heavy music being spread? Were people accepting it? Yeah, I, I think it was like, uh, it, it, it wasn't just like me, right? Like, because I always say that I wouldn't be able to do it if it, there weren't already so many good bands that I could put on a show, right? And there was already like a resurgence going on. There were new bands that were like much better than the old bands we had. Orion Odyssey, a bunch of bands from Islamabad, like I See Insanity, Downfall Humanity, like there's so many bands that I can't even remember now, right? Like, and they were all putting out good songs. They're more uh, thrash metal was a big thing. Almost every band was a death thrash band at the time, you know. So yeah, like 
I just gave them all the platform to put on a performance. Like that, that that's all I did. And pe- there was another uh, event that happened in Islamabad too, a few months or a year before my event. It was at a more professional level than my event. But after my event, I think people felt like they could put on in random locations too. Because we later on a show happened in a swimming pool, a show happened in a wedding area or some shit, you know. And so, so yeah, I think that that thing definitely happened. Yo, I think Pakistan has something going, dude. If 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 there's shows and swimming pools and wedding <laughs> wedding halls, that could be like like in the USA, they always talk about VFW halls or whatever. You got wedding halls and swimming pools, motherfucker. That's right. <laughs> So you're saying that your shows actually had bands from outside of Lahore, so bands from Islamabad and Karachi. So as a as a promoter, were you paying their their? How were they getting to Lahore bus? Yeah, dude. At the time, most of them just came on their own money, mm-hmm. and I didn't pay any single band. Okay, no one was asking me money because they knew that in what condition I am putting it on. They knew that I'm not even gonna break even. It was like a collective effort from everyone just because they loved metal. They loved, they loved heavy music. They wanted you to do this. And they knew that they didn't have any other opportunities. It's their chance to make a scene, right? And a lot of bands that I've put on went on to like access better opportunities and better stages as well. So like to think of uh, those gigs as like a stepping stone for a lot of bands, you know? At that show, Takatak was playing and so Takatak was famous for like the best moshes in the country at that point and it all started at mosh pit well one that was the name of the first show i put on and this this was mosh pit too so there was a big kind of buzz going into the show that yeah the the, the moshes at Takatak they're gonna be brutal and what they did was like half the crowd was oh they put them there like 100 people there 100 people there and we all just fucking swarmed into each other man like i got battered i battered some people some people battered me everyone battered each other it was beautiful chaos man and it was amazing oh man i mean that's the way to do it right like if you're gonna put on a show that has an impact it's gotta be something visually explosive where people are gonna go home and talk about what they just experienced yeah man. that's yeah, six of course of course definitely now with so then you had foreskin and then you continue to put on shows, but I, I still want to understand is that when you're putting on shows with 200, 300 people in Pakistan, I mean, the noise is going to get out there that this kind of event is happening. So what happened with security and, and stuff? Man, that's, that's the, that's the thing. No one ever gave a shit. No fucking media ever covered us. Like, n- it was, you know, like it was, we were just existing in our parallel universe doing our shit. And in a way that was like truly underground, you know, we didn't really care much about security threats because we knew that the, those the people who would want to hurt us for playing this kind of music, they don't even know of our existence, you know, they're concerned with other institutions of the state, you know, they're, they're concerned with the big artistic and cultural zones and centers. They don't even know that we exist. We just have 400 plays on YouTube and 200 of them are in the crowd. (laughs) (laughs) So your entire time putting on shows, you had no security threats at all? Never. Wow, that's great to hear. Did you do any sort of like patting people down when they're coming in? Did you have to do that? I remember actually this second show was at the time when a big um, Pakistani politician was assassinated. And I don't want to get too much into that, but there was a big pressure on me from people to stop the show and I was like fuck it I'm just gonna let the show go on and it did you know (laughs) nothing happened and nothing would have anyway and you never had to pat anybody down because people walk around with guns and stuff at Pakistan yeah man it's guts look uh, gun culture is a very normal thing in Punjab Mm. it's it's not common uh, not uncommon to find walk into a place and someone already is you know as they say is trapped now if we're fast forward a little bit, because Foreskin is, I think I actually remember Foreskin was the band that I think I knew you at. You had just wrapped it up or something. 
then you got into multinational corporations, which to me is like your big like coming out, like a Hassan has arrived. <laughs> Tell me how, how did you then transition into Grindcore? I know you've always, you know, like you're such a well-read man, super well-educated. And I remember you're always just like, yeah, but I mean, Grindcore people seem to always forget that Grindcore comes from hardcore and punk rock. How did you then go from your, you know, your Black Flag, Cro-Magsy stuff into Grindcore? Yeah, like um, it started off as a joke, actually. <laughs> like we foreskin was still going on and we were just chilling at Shiraz's place and we were like thinking like, yeah, let's just make a bullshit grand core political like demo of Snare. We just blast beats and a breakdown. And there are three vocalists on the same song. It was called <laughs> Emulating the Parliament. And it was, it was like a shock value thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> Talking about, uh, we had another song called Presidential Castration, you know, like it was, and, we, we didn't have a sonic quality to it. We're like sonic philosophy, I mean, or like a clear lyrical philosophy with the band. It was just 19, 20 year old kids, you know, just have, getting some frustrations out. And then we, it went dormant. We released a demo called Equality in 2012. And after that, multinational was like dormant for a few years. In the meantime, we did some stuff with Foreskin and still kept going on, but we suddenly just decided to do a multi a multinational corporations EP. And what triggered that was, there was an artist called Amik Zaman. He's done almost all the art for multinational corporations. And he just sent this Jamaat al Moth artwork as, you know, like some appreciation, right? Like, yeah, I made this art for you, for your band multinational corporations. And he, he, he named Jamaat al Moth there too, before there was ever a song called Jamaat al Moth. You know. Oh, so he so, came up with a name. Yeah, exactly. He, he's actually he's actually a fucking genius guy, the fucking creative guy. He's a lot of song titles and other stuff. He's often helped me with along the way. So that became your once you got the artwork, you suddenly guys were like fired up to actually like create some music then. Yeah, exactly. I sent it to Shiraz and he was like, Yeah, man, we should actually do something. <laughs> That's and uh, it, yes, it was great core, but it was also um kind of receptive of the influence of the hardcore that was going around at the time, like the HM2 stuff where they were blending metallic hardcore with Swedish death metal, you know? So there was that influence in it too, like an extended breakdown, sludgy breakdowns. And we we also like tried never to make it a pure grindcore band. Cause yes. yeah, we love grindcore, like Brutal Truth, Nepal Death and all that stuff, you know? And it, for us, it's always a punk genre, but we also recognize that the best grindcore bands they weren't setting out to make just grindcore. They were setting out to make extreme fucking music. And they had influences from every fucking way, from bands, from post-punk bands to fucking, you know, like, you name it, man. Like, you can find industrial influences in grindcore. Sometimes a Napalm Death song just sounds like a sped-up industrial song with guitars on it, you know? Like, it's, it's, it's organized chaos. And we tried to have that approach with it, like, reflecting the music that we listen to, reflecting... You know, everything about us as human beings, that it, it came out in that, in Shiraz's guitar playing and everything. Yeah, I mean, that EP, like you're saying, like, uh, I never thought about it that way of, like, analyzing the music and the different elements in it. But you're right. Like, if I think back to why it resonates so much with me, it's because it has so much different stuff in it. Like, there's actual groove elements in there. Like, it does actually feel like a Napalm Death record, right? Instead of just straight blast beats and, like, shrieking vocals. There's, like, parts where, like, it's, like, sludgy maybe, but more that groove element, like, of, of Napalm Death, which makes it so, like, so much fun to listen to. And you and every time, like, I find myself every couple months listening back to that record, man. <laughs> yeah, we even had, like, an Oi Punk song on it, you know, LPC. Yeah, so with a an oi punk song with like a speed metal guitar solo. So we were just like, you know, fuck every musical standard. We're doing what the fuck we want, you know. Right. And if that's not punk enough for you, then you know, like LBC, you know, you know what that means. Yeah. So then, were at this point, were you already singing in in Urdu, or were you were? Uh, you know, when you were talking about uh, the local language thing, trying to bridge the language gap. 
that was a big thing with me and multinational corporations. I started developing the sense that there needs to be parts in the music that are in Urdu. There needs to be parts uh, that people can relate to. You know, because I can talk all the fancy shit in English. That ain't gonna get through to people, you know. I need to speak in my my vernacular, the, the language I think in, the language I speak in. So, and it's not even like perfect Urdu in there. It's like Lahori style Urdu, a lot of like Punjabi influences and inflections and stuff like that. So, I was just being myself, and I I, I screamed the best in the Urdu parts on the record when I said Jamaat al Maat, when I said in white collar communism the Urdu parts, and you know all that stuff. And did you find an in like an immediate reaction in the audience or the people that were listening once they heard it in Urdu? Absolutely, man. Absolutely, fucking absolutely. Because what happened was that people from the death metal scenes in Bangladesh and black metal scenes in India who had never fucking given the time of day to like actual grindcore. To them, grindcore was death grind or gore grind. You know, like that's not grindcore to me. That's subgenres of death metal yeah. <laughs> to me. Because yeah. grindcore needs to have like a punk base, punk yeah. base. To, it, riffs and crusty sounds and stuff, you know, so they were suddenly into it because they could fucking hear me say Lund Pechara, they could hear me say like Hanchor and all that shit, you know, <laughs> it was like, fuck man, <laughs> at, at live shows too, I saw like the the same kids who are, whose favorite bands are, you know, Dream Theater and Opeth or Pantera and, you know, shit like that, they, they were rocking out to the music and they were singing every line and also the, the Urdu line is a bit harder. So maybe like having the Urdu stuff in there made all the, the rest more accessible, you know? Yeah, I mean, that was the exact reaction what we had here in King Lai Chi. Like when I, the first year King Lai Chi was all, I was singing in English. And then my, I got a bass player the second year. And I, I just, I was like, you have to start writing Chinese Cantonese lyrics. And it was like a, it was like a switch went off in the pit suddenly people were listening to it. And like you said, like they didn't have to spend hard time like looking at the lyrics, translating it, trying to understand how to attach it to their, their life and journey. They could hear it immediately and shit just went off for us. Yeah, yeah man, exactly, exactly. That's how it is. That's how it is. And when you were talking about that, I immediately was just remembering all this too, you know. The, uh, the other thing that I've always wondered about Pakistan and its metal scene is that it didn't feel like it was very well received outside of Pakistan. Is it because, what, what do you think? Why, why is it so hard for Pakistani bands to get their name out there? I, I'll be honest. The kind of pa music Pakistani metal bands were trying to make at the time was like very mainstream metal minded. They were underground bands making mainstream metal music and underground labels, underground bands, underground everything overseas are not gonna appreciate it. Lamb of God worship band or a Slayer worship band or a Metallica worship band from Pakistan, you know? Like maybe maybe it would add more street cred in their metal world if they were an entombed worship band. <laughs> <laughs> even though I think, I think even that's fucking ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But basically, and people weren't making the kind of music like overseas people would be interested in, right? Like it wasn't... This, the, some bands that got appreciation, they did have that approach, but most, most didn't. I think there needs to be more shows and stuff. I see some good bands popping up nowadays. There's a death metal band from Islamabad these days. There's a band from Karachi that's going to come out soon. Um, and yeah, like I see people trying to do good stuff, but I, shows are the main thing, man. Like, come on. You can't have a scene without constant shows. And to have those shows more, I think that language barrier finally needs to be crossed. You know, in Germany, bands sing in, in German and Sweden, bands sing in Swedish. So why, why aren't we doing it in Punjabi and Urdu and Sindhi and Pakhto and all the local languages, you know? Because, yeah, it's true that people speak English everywhere in Pakistan and understand it, but it's a very limited understanding. For us, English is a very formal language, not a casual language, you know? We can't... You, I, I've begun to use English as a casual language here because I'm forced to speak it as a casual language, you know. But I know that I can't be myself unless I speak in my 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 Lahori style of speaking Urdu, you know. I know that's the same for most people in Lahore. They want to 
they can only express themselves in Punjabi or Lahori style Urdu and I know in Peshawar it's Pashto and so and so forth in the country you know so bands need to tap into that lo- that local side and through that local side they will get more international exposure you know I think the reason people were interested in multinational corporations was because we were talking about local issues in, in local languages. All the reviewers were very fascinated. Oh, this Urdu part, blah, blah, blah. Some fucking guy in Slovenia somewhere is writing, you know. So bands need to embrace who they are, you know. So that's interesting. So with multinational corporations, you're not saying the um, Pakistani media had interest. You're actually saying that that was the first band that, uh, that you performed in that had international media interest yeah like definitely man like we we got we got articles on websites that we used to read you know to f- discover other bands from and that was a big big like validation for us like yeah we're, we're we're not just some fucking kids from pakistan because we never thought of ourselves as like typical pakistani or even pakistanis anyway you know like we were always treated like foreigners in our country so getting validation from abroad, especially from like neighboring countries like India and Nepal and Bangladesh, and it, it feels very good, you know. All right, Hassan, this has been such a pleasure. It's so fascinating and so enlightening. Like you have really completely changed my impression and perspective of life in Pakistan for metalheads and people into heavy music. I honestly did not think there was a as big of a scene or as big of a community as you've mentioned. And you completely turned my world around where I almost want to like get into it more like i want to know more about what was happening in pakistan when you were growing up so i would have to say hassan that you're one of the first guests that i must bring back at some point so we can dive deeper into this dive deeper in the bands the pakistani bands the bands that came before your generation and how did they kind of foster encourage what you were doing maybe and of course i know that we stopped in the middle of multinational corporation but that band went on and you did another, I think it was a split release. And then you started a great band called Dead Bortos, which was amazing. Got lots of international press. And then of course your eventual move to Europe where you finally got to see punk and hardcore metal shows with your own eyes. And I'm sure that is a whole episode on itself. So Hassan, let's do this. I will promise that you're coming back. I'm going to look at the viewers now. Viewers, he is definitely coming back in a future episode. But to help wrap this one up, Hassan, for the world outside of Pakistan, what do you want to say to them about what's going on in Pakistan? It's not as bad as you think, man. <laughs> I think the food is better and the mountains are prettier, so you should visit it. And yeah, you'll be safe. You're, you, if you're a white tourist, you'll be safe. Don't worry. No one will harm you or anything. It's us, <laughs> us, us brown people there that are in danger, not you. <laughs> Visit us, give us your money and so that Pakistan gets a little better. All right, Hassan. This was such a great conversation. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day in Germany because you're, you're six or seven hours behind me. So your day has just started. It's literally nighttime here in Hong Kong. Yeah, but my day just started. It's sunny outside. I'm going to go cycle and shit. So, yeah. All right, bro. Take it easy. <laughs> All right, that's it. The end of episode seven. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you enjoyed everything that he had to say, everything we had to say, all the things that we mentioned. I hope you continue to subscribe and click the notification bell wherever it is. Please click that so you know when the next episodes go up. We try to do this every Sunday um, and we just love it that there is an audience watching this. Peace. Enjoy the rest of your week. You